Hi, this is Andy Kaufman, President of the Institute for Leadership Excellence Development Incorporated. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the People and Projects Podcast. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And, and one, one man, man in his time, time plays, plays many, many parts. parts. <laughs> okay. All right, so for the record, I've never memorized Shakespeare before, okay? But I bet you've heard of that line before, right? All the world's a stage. I, I suppose that makes for good theater. But do you think it's possible that it could mean even more than that? My guest today is Kathy Salen. She's CEO of Performance of a Lifetime and author of a remarkable new book entitled Performance Breakthrough. You know, Kathy's basic premise is that Shakespeare had it right, that all the world is a stage. In fact, she goes so far as to say, Every interaction is a performance. Like when you're talking with your colleagues. When you're interacting with your boss. Hey! Quit stalling, get back to work! How you interact with your children. How you try to talk yourself out of getting into trouble. Could it be that everything's a performance? Or does the idea kind of make you skeptical? As if such a premise would mean that you're just going around faking it. I mean, just wearing a mask of sorts, which seems to smack of inauthenticity. Well, I want to say that this book, Performance Breakthrough, is probably one of the most influential books for me personally in the last six months or so. And there's a number of reasons, but you know, one of the ideas is this idea that Kathy talks about the becoming principle. And she differentiates that from the knowing paradigm, the idea of the becoming principles. I'm in the process of becoming better at something. I'm not there yet, but I'm in the process of becoming and how performance can be part of that. Where the knowing paradigm is more like, I'm only comfortable, I can only speak up if I know something. And she uses that to explain why this performance stuff is not necessarily a matter of being inauthentic. You know, if you lead people, if you lead projects, I'm telling you, you're on a stage. If you wanna get better at speaking up in meetings, having difficult conversations, there are many ideas in this book. So join me in welcoming Kathy Salant, CEO of the organization called Performance of a Lifetime as she talks with us about her book, Performance Breakthrough. We're talking today with Kathy Salen, author of a wonderful new book entitled Performance Breakthrough, A Radical Approach to Success at Work. So Kathy, thank you for joining us on the People and Projects podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Oh yeah, you know, Kathy, I'd say that probably the single biggest point I took away from the book is that Shakespeare wasn't kidding <laughs> when he penned the words that all the world is a stage. And you're proposing that everything we do is a performance. In fact, even right now, as a host and as a guest, maybe even those who are listening and watching, we're playing roles. And, you know, if we learn to embrace that, what I took from this is that the opportunities to learn and grow are just so big. So I'm interested from your perspective, why is it that seeing everything as a performance is so critical? Well, because I think it gives us a way to access our agency to create the scenes of our lives, to create the scenes of our workplace. And we often will feel like, well, I am just who I am. Things are just the way they are. Yeah. But if everything is a play, if all the world's a stage, then what, what, are the, what does that mean? It means that we're the performers, we're the writers, we're the stage managers, we're the costume <laughs> designers, we're the actors. And so we can 
impact on and make choices about how the scene and how the play is going and how and who we are, which character, which version of ourselves do we want to perform? And I think that it, it leans more towards human beings being fundamentally creative, mm. that, that, that the human species is a creative species and performance helps us, helps us tap into our creativity, not just, not just as in painting or you know, singing or dancing, but our creativity in how we live and work, how we converse with others, how we collaborate. I, that's a great way of saying it. Like, I, I feel like, in, in fact, you blow this myth away in the book as well. Some people think I'm either creative or I'm not, or I'm an introvert or an extrovert or I'm not. I'm a performer or not. And, and in the book, you just describe it so clearly of how that's such a limiting view. In fact, uh, after reading your book, Kathy, I just, I recognize that a lot of my early career was performed, so to speak, mm-hmm. under the assumptions of what you call the knowing paradigm versus the becoming principle, okay? So how would you kind of summarize or unpack those ideas and why is it so important for us to understand this becoming principle in order to grow? Great question. You're a great question asker. Well, thank you. <laughs> you, you, you. You should do a podcast. <laughs> I'm on to that. You should be in the improv. <laughs> okay, all right, good. Um, uh, well, the knowing paradigm, uh, it was penned actually by a colleague of mine, a woman uh, named Dr. Lois Holzman, a developmental psychologist. And, and what she talks about, and I reference this in the book, as you say, uh, this idea that, that ev- we think that everything can be known yeah. and that we think that in order to move forward, we have to know what we're doing right. and that what's fundamental is information is knowledge um, and is knowing what's happening but here's the problem with that we don't know what's happening (laughs) i mean i don't know if anybody notices it but the world is changing rapidly and yes there are things that are you know constant and that seem to have some sort of permanence if you will but there's so much that is in flux there's so much that is constantly transforming and changing. And so if we're using a a way of thinking or a way of seeing as I must know what's happening, I must know what something is. And in order for me to excel, in order for me to to move on to the next stage, for example, in my career, I have to know how that's going to go. I have to know how to do it. Then we won't be connected to the actual circumstances that we're in. I mean, the other thing I'll say is that perhaps this is helpful for our listeners. the education system in our country is very focused on the knowing paradigm. And so what that means is that edu- tests and kids doing well on tests is mistaken for education. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with educating our young people. It has to do with doing good on tests. And so that's sort of an extreme example, but it is the way we operate. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm not against knowledge. I mean, I'm not against information. I'm just saying that it, to, to, to live life and to, to think you have to work that way, I, don't, I think that holds us back. The becoming principle as an alternative is one that is grounded in this idea that, yeah, things are what they are and that things are always what they are becoming, what they are not yet. And so I think that that idea, if we are in that space where we understand that we are, um, we're both in the play that exists. We are the creators of the play. We're part of an ensemble of others who are making things happen that haven't happened yet. Right. Yeah. You know, you, um, you shared a quote, I don't remember the guy's name, Ludwig Wittgenberg or something like that. But Ludwig Wittgenstein. You say that so much better. <laughs> and, <laughs> even the accent was awesome. But, but it's something along the lines that vocabulary matters. And if our vocabulary is limited, then we limit our world. It was the essence of it. And what I love about this becoming principle is it's vocabulary that can stretch us. For example, uh, I, I was exposed to the principle, but I didn't have the vocabulary. One of my first big presentations, this was, this was 18 years ago or so. It was in front of 7,500 people. And Kathy, at this time, if I had to speak in front of 10 people, I was freaked out. And so my, my mother-in-law and my wife were just saying, well, just pretend like you're not nervous. And I'm like, this is the most ridiculous advice I've ever heard. They're like, just pre-. what they were saying is, 
you know what? Of course you're nervous, but you're becoming a speaker, right? You're be- yeah. Don't worry about the fact that you're not that yet. How about you become that thing? And this, this principle, yeah. which is really what you guys are all about as an organization, is to help people become. Don't worry about being that yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, you have to pretend to be the thing that you are not yet. I mean, and I use this example that um, comes from a, a Russian psychologist by the name of Lev Vygotsky, another another uh, high-minded intellectual that a head taller, a head taller. Yes, he talks about that. But this idea that um, what do we do when with babies, right? So babies. When, when, when there's, you know, adorable little bundles of, you know, joy, right? Or poop, depending on how you're looking at it, you know? And they go, you know, and we, the big people, we turn to this, you know, little child and we say, okay, sweetheart, let me go get you your bottle. Now, the child did not say that. But we speak to the baby as if they are speaking, as if they are, and they are both, we relate to them as both who they are and who they are not at the same time. We know that they will become speakers. And so we have millions of conversations with our little babies, and that's literally what teaches them how to speak. And so what's the, what's the adult equivalent for that? <laughs> well, because that represents a giant transformation for a child when you go from speaker to non, from non-speaker to speaker. And so when you were describing your story, it's like to go from, you know, I don't talk, to, I don't talk in front of people to, to now you're talking in front of 75 people. You have to pretend that you're the kind of person that does that. And lo and behold, you, you become that. And your mother was there supporting you to do that. So right on mom. <laughs> well, so even a mother-in-law. So a mother-in-law, up, mother-in-law. Thumbs up for mother-in-laws. But, you know, it kind of related, um, related to this is it could be that I could have tried it on, right? You talk about try it. It could be that I could have tried it on and say, I hate this. I never want to do it again. And I could have found that out that I don't want to become that. But as it turns out, I did become that. And it probably wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have gotten that sort of advice and that sort of opportunity. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so here's, here's the thing. Like you, you give this as an example early in the book. And I just think I would be freaked out to be in a Kathy <laughs> session because you guys do all these. I, I was mesmerized by the, the exercises that you do. And one of them is the signature exercise, which you call the performance of a lifetime. So I'd love it if you explain like what it is. And why I might say that it sounds like it'd be freaky, but also why it's so fundamental at actually helping people along the way here. Okay. Yeah, great. It is the exercise that we got the name of our company from. Uh, we named our, our company after it. So what it is, is uh, we invite our participants to come up on stage one at a time and to perform their lives in one minute. To perform, they have 60 whole seconds to perform their entire life. And it can be anything. It can be something, you know, very, very significant and important um, to somebody. It could be something mundane. It could be funny. It could be sad. Uh, it could be your entire life. It could be a particular moment in your life. It's whatever people do, it's, it's them. So you can't get it wrong. Okay. Right. This, by the way, totally throws you out of the knowing po- paradigm. So it's it sort of, it's a little bit of, you know, sort of shock therapy, if you will, in the sense that you really can't control what it is that you're going to say or do because you're, you're really out of your comfort zone. Um, and you need to perform it, meaning it's not getting up on stage and saying, you know, hi, my name is Kathy Salem. I'm from New York City, blah, 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 blah. You know, you have to do, my name is Kathy Rose, <laughs> you know, or whatever the equivalent is, right? And, um, and then we, uh, we, they get huge round of applause. And by the way, let me say, this, I, this is really important. We do a lot of work with the audience on the performance as an audience, because I think applause and giving people unconditional support, it's like the equivalent of what we do with our little babies. You know, it's like, you can do it, you know? And, and it's not just you can do it. It's like, oh my God, everybody is sitting there in the audience and um, they're like, oh, are they gonna call me? Huh? And what we say is, you still have to be there for your colleagues. And that makes a huge difference, huge difference to the performer. So people perform their lives and they do, such an interesting mix of things. I mean, you just see such amazing performances. And then 
we are inspired, we meaning the members of the Performance of a Lifetime team are inspired by what we see and we give them some theatrical direction uh, to do a sequel. And then we often will put one or more of our professional improvisers into the sequel with them. And that's another experience of taking their story and, and, and going somewhere un, you know, unexpected with it and involving other people in it. And it's, um, the, what's, it's very frightening, I think, initially for people, but the impact that it has is that people feel, it's this funny thing about performance. People sometimes feel like, oh, well, if I'm performing, I'm phony. But actually, by performing, you're actually able to be more of who you are because you're giving expression to parts of yourself that you don't typically do. So it has a very big impact because people say, I've been working with this guy for the last 20 years and I didn't know nothing about you. And now I know more about you from your one minute. And, and people say that over and over and they're like, thank you. Thank you for like, I had no idea that you've been through this. I didn't know you were so talented or I didn't know you were so funny or I didn't realize that about your daughter that she had had gone through this dip and so on. Um, so it, it's, um, I think that one of the things about le for leaders, I think often people feel like, well, how do I do things that feel hard? Mm. How do I help other people make leaps and get out of their comfort zone? One of the reasons that we do the exercise is a way to help people to, I think if you're gonna help other people grow, if, you're, if as a leader, you're, you're gonna inspire and motivate other people to, you've got to, go through some risky stuff yourself because then you're in a better position to say, oh, yeah. well, I understand why this is hard for you. Let me see how I can help you. And it creates a kind of a community. One of the things that we're finding, Andy, is that, and I didn't know this when we first started. Um, I don't even know if I knew it until maybe about five or six years ago. And maybe this is a shift that's going on. Hmm. I think there's more and more of an interest in creating community inside the workplace um, yeah. and people feeling like I need to be connected to the people that I'm working side by side with. And, you know, I'm not, it's not like a kumbaya love fest. Mm -hmm. it, it's more like, I don't know anything about you. And, right. and, 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 and this is a way for people to, to get to know each other in new ways. And when you take risks together and you get through the other side, yeah, that's a, that's a powerful experience. And oh, yeah. so it has all of those ingredients. I, I can only imagine. And uh, I, I don't know, I just see it in my own life. It's certainly easy to see it in other people's lives, but I, I just see how I self-limit my, my, you know, my abilities. I'll say, well, I could never do that, right? And like you said, that thing is the shock therapy in that it, it, <laughs> It shows you. Yes, in fact, you can't do that. You can't plan it. It's it's. There's no way you could do it perfectly. Yeah. There's so many things, and I I hadn't really thought about the community aspect. Although now reflecting on your book, you actually make that really clear. That a lot of times people are like, oh, that leader who went through this tough thing in her life, we 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 always saw her as so distant, and now we see no we're more about it. I mean, that's a powerful story in the book. That one I don't remember the names, but is there are so many examples that. Um, that all I can say is, if there's anything about what we just talked about from a listener and they go, I don't think I'm going to hire Kathy, hire her, okay? It's, <laughs> it'll be worth it. It's not scary. It's not that scary. It's actually really powerful. Compare that to a typical training session. Go yeah, pretty class. different. Here's the agenda. You know, this is when you fall asleep, right? I mean, that's, it's not that, right? Yeah, you, do, you don't fall asleep in our workshops. <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, you'll be singing. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so we, had, we had Dan Pink on the podcast right after To Sell Us Human was published. Yeah. And you, talk, you, you talk about some ideas from there. But he, he talked about this idea of listen for the offer. But I can, I, I'm not just saying this because you, know, you and I are talking. I don't think I really appreciated or understood it until you unpacked it actually much more richly with, with I mean, of course, you have to see if I actually got it. But the thought is people are giving us offers all the time. Right. You know? right like, right. like if while you're answering, I'm just like, <sighs> you know, I, I guess I'm giving you an offer. Now we might say that that's feedback, but there's something about people are giving us offers all the time. Even if they say, no, there's an offer there. They're giving yeah. us these offers and, how, how would you summarize kind of this idea better than I did? And what, what's the power of listening for these things? 
Um, well, have you ever done or seen any improv comedy? Sure, absolutely. Okay, okay. so what, what's happening, right? So these, there are these guys and these gals up on the stage and they usually, you know, are very, very funny. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my God, they just can't believe that they're making this up. It's just too good. They must have planned at least some of this. But what's actually happening is that they are listening, they are hearing the offers that are coming at them, you know, whether that's, you know, somebody walks in and says, you know, you're under arrest. And you might have been thinking that, you know, you were going to be mom, mom, you know, now maybe your mom is a police officer and she is, you know, you know, putting you under arrest. You could play with that. But the point is, is that that's an offer, even if it was unexpected. And so what the improviser does is they say yes to that offer. They, they're like, it's almost like some combination of, you know, listening on steroids and x-ray, he, you know, hearing, because you are listening to build with what it is that you hear. Right. And so that you're not actually just hearing offers, you're building with those offers. And so if you take that idea, that is what we do when we're on stage as improvisers, and you bring that into everyday life, there's going to be a, a bouquet of opportunities, which includes, as you were saying, Andy, things like, no, 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 I'm not interested in that at all, you know, or I don't like anything that you're saying, if, if that's the offer. Because if you ignore it, nothing is going to happen. If you deny it, it, it the scene ends, if you will, or, or it's just a one-way street. But if... But there, and there are so many ways to hear and build with offers. So, um, you know, yeah, like when I think I just, I think one of the stories that I use in the book is this thing of like, and this is a very common problem. You have salespeople or, you know, who go in and you have your PowerPoint deck and you, you know, you, you, ha you come in with what it is that you want to sell, you know, and you're like plowing through it, you know, and you don't notice that the person or the, you know, the people that are in front of you have been looking at their watch you know, are typing something on their phone um, and are like, you know, gazing out the window. If you, if you, if you, if what you're thinking is, okay, all right, I just got to get through this a little quicker and you start talking faster. It's just, it's not the most effective thing, but you could say, how's this going for you? Right, right, <laughs> you, right, could, right. you could, you could, mm -hmm. in, in using the vernacular from, from the theater, you could say, I, you know, let me, let me, let me cut here. Let me cut here. Let's do a take two. Take two. How's the scene going? What would be helpful, you know, to you or, or is now still a good time? Or, you know what, let me jump ahead for, you know, for example. And, um, you know, or when people say some version of no, mm -hmm. if you want them to say yes, you could say, oh, you know, why? You know, and sometimes people are like, I don't want to, I don't want to, what if, what if, you know, I don't know what to say. Well, that's, if you're not, if you're not stuck in the, in the knowing paradigm, there's no problem. Like you could sit back and you could say, oh, that's so interesting. I thought, I thought that you would actually want what, but you're not interested in this. So, so let's figure out what to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you give a lot of good examples for salespeople um, in there of, you know, in, instead of just a consultative sell, and here's our process of, you know, and you reinforce what Dan does in his book, but they were all salespeople and that we're all trying to influence in some way or trying to learn in some way. And I, I guess I, I mean, I know body language is important. I know vocal tone is important, but I think once again, back to that vocabulary idea that listen for the offer, we are giving each other clues yeah, As so often, and I don't know. It's it's. I, I appreciate the effort you put into taking a uh, something that, as an improv person, is just obvious to you. But for the rest of us, it's easy for us to be pretty clueless, or maybe we pick up on it. But in our discomfort in the situation, we decide to just ignore the data <laughs> and just plow on through. Well, right? well, I think that's. I think that last point is really is very prevalent, and and I'm glad you brought it up because I think that part of what the work is. In, in working with our clients, and I, and I hope that, this, that the reader gets this kind of help as well, that we, we do in fact see and hear a lot, but because we're like, mm, I'm not really sure what to do with it, right. um, we ignore it. And, and I think that's um, a missed opportunity for making a connection 
with another human being um, and also and, and whatever the result of that connection, whether it's a sale, whether it's getting people on board. I mean, so for example, I've done, we've done a lot of work with leaders who are, you know, trying to move an organization from where it is now to where it needs to be, where it wants to be. And they'll do a lot of work to sort of, you know, create what the messaging is and to do the kinds of formal corporate communications and to maybe even have some rallies, the equivalent of a town hall meeting, you know, blah, 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 blah. But they have a harder time saying, um, what are your concerns about this shift? Mm-hmm. To the people who are, you know, going to be affected by it and or who also they want to bring on board to help, you know, make it happen. And, and but like, what do you see as the, as the challenges? What, you know, and then letting that land and taking that seriously yeah. and saying, gee, let's figure out what to do about that. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that people miss, I think they, that we want to get to the results so I quickly agree. and yeah. we don't think about, well, what's the process that we have to go through? And that include that involves hearing offers. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a it's such a powerful idea. You know, just to kind of apply some of these ideas, I'd love to throw some scenarios by you, okay? okay? So the majority of our listeners are either project managers or project sponsors, or they're in some sort of project role, or they're leaders of teams and they just want to get better at this. But let's say someone's been assigned to, you know, run a project that's bigger than what they're used to. And because of the size and the complexity, it's getting them involved with stakeholders that are higher level in the organization than what they're used to. And quite frankly, they're feeling kind of intimidated in these meetings and they feel like maybe because they're in the knowing principle, I, I can't speak up unless what I say is going to really be important. So they're not speaking up when they know they should be, but they just feel intimidated by that. So any ideas on how you might guide them through something like this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that is a scene in the new play. Yep. They are now in a new play and they ha- had played a particular character and now they have a new character that they're sort of, you know, mm-hmm. their way into. And I think that could be a, a, back to the thing you were saying about vocabulary and language. I think that having that language can be helpful. So then it's like, okay, well, what's my character doing in this scene? And what is this scene? And sometimes I think more, I think this is more available to people than they realize, but you can talk to other people. (laughs) You can ask for their help. So you can talk to somebody who goes to these meetings regularly and say, what is this meeting about? Like what happens here? Who are the players? You know, what can I expect? Do you, do you have any advice for me in that meeting? So, so number one, that both gives you a little bit of a heads up, uh, it also, um, you now have potentially a buddy or two who, you know, is watching out for you. I mean, you know, you have to pick the right person. You don't want to pick somebody who's an a-hole who's going to basically undermine you. And there's plenty of that that goes on. Um, so I think that this thing of like, you know, like when I go and speak, for example, um, and I'm speaking more and more now that the book is out, I, an actor goes and checks out the environment, checks out the stage, you know, and and figures out like, well, who's in the audience and like, where am I going to stand? And and like, I really recommend that people go to the conference room in advance and like, check out what the scenery is, Mm -hmm. where do I want to sit and so on. So that's one thing. Um, The other thing is to figure out what is your objective in this scene, especially in the early days, right? So maybe what your performance is, is that you want to be a learner and you're you're just, you want to be the best learner that you can possibly be and just be focused on that. So what does a learner do? Well, a learner might ask questions, you know, a learner might say, you know, ask for clarification. Uh, And, and and maybe one of the things that you ask one of your colleagues beforehand is, is that, you know, do you think that's a good idea? You could say, I want to make sure that I'm learning and I know what people are talking about, but I don't want to be disruptive. What's the scene? Is that something that's done? Right. They might say, I don't know. Nobody ever asked any question. You know, maybe you should be the first one. Right. <laughs> but I, so I think that um, this thing of like giving yourself something to do. And I think especially that wonderful, but scary time when you're sort of brand new at it. 
I think that you can take advantage of, I'm going to be a learner. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to be, okay. and, then, and then after, after the scene, you know, say, is that typical? Is that how it's go? You know, and so on. So um, get some buddies. One of the things I talk about in the book is, is forming a performance board of directors. Right. And um, especially when you're trying to do new stuff, like gather some people around and that, can, that are going to help you through this. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think the becoming principal, like you said, it, it's, it's give yourself a break, right? You're not used to being here. I'm becoming someone who can be comfortable yeah. there. Right? So let's give ourselves a break. Yeah. And, um, you know, I also thought of, although you put it in the context of networking, one of the advice you have, piece of advice you have for networking is think of somebody who's a really good networker. And what if you modeled after them? You know, so I, I think yeah. like who, who, how would my, uh, my uh, former boss, Bob, talk up in this meeting. You know, how would he, and so maybe use that as a model. I, it seems like that could maybe work. Totally, right. totally. Yeah. I do that constantly. I mean, this is, this is sort of a funny story, but um, <laughs> there was this, there was this, this, is, this is many years ago, and there was a person that I was meeting, a woman I was meeting, who I was very, very intimidated by. I won't go into the detail about why or anything like that. Um, and I was talking to a colleague. I'm like, you know, when I'm around her, I just get like very, very nervous and awkward. And then mm. she goes, this is my, this is my, my performance of a lifetime coach at the time. She was like, channel Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how to talk like Catherine Hepburn. And so she said, well, let's practice it, you know? So, so you know, I was like, hello, Lauren. <laughs> Hello, Lord. And it's just, it, I mean, and I didn't literally do that, but just like having her, having Catherine Hepburn within me right. was so much fun, number one. And it also literally just sort of gave me a certain kind of authority. And the thing is, of course, as you, you know, as you were describing, you know, like, well, what would Bob do? You're not going to, you don't run the risk of becoming Bob. No. You know, you won't lose yourself. You're just, you're just like, as you were saying before, trying it on and adding this option to your repertoire. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, once again, language. What really, really sunk to me here is you say, hey, you know what? You used to have an ensemble role. Now you've got a speaking part. <laughs> you know, just realize that's part of your role. Yeah. You, uh, I don't have to go in like John Wayne, like the one example you gave in a book, but I need to just think what could help me prepare to become increasingly become that role so so if that intrigues people there's stuff in the book about that i would give another one here this is another scenario that i see a lot where someone uh, was a peer and let's say that uh this person's name is cheryl we'll go because this is modeling one off of your book right Example. Yes. and and cheryl's now promoted and she's now managing her former peers and let's say there was a melissa all right. And Melissa, in my version of this story, is somebody who is leading projects, but she hasn't been hitting her deadlines. And the thing is, the former boss didn't really hold Melissa accountable. So now Cheryl's got this awkwardness of I'm, I'm now managing a peer and that now, um, you know, person on my team is not delivering. I need to give some constructive feedback. This is awkward by just about any, you know, measure. And so what are the pitfalls that can come in these sorts of performances, let's say, and how might you coach uh, Cheryl when she's talking to Melissa? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that we find with one mistake that I think people make a lot, and it's, I think it's understandable because as you said, these are like awkward conversations and so you're like, oh my God, do I really have to do this? And so <coughs> one of the things that people will just do is sort of just spew the facts. It's okay. just like, it's like, you know, you were short here. You didn't, you, you, you know, you didn't, you didn't make the deadline there. You didn't make your numbers here. You know, it's, it's almost like if I, if I talk really fast and just do the facts, like when people talk loud, you know, when somebody speaks a different language than you, it's just, it's just like, hello. Um, you, you think that, um, that if I, I, I've done my job because I've, I've shared the facts. Um, but what we found, um, you know, both in the case with Cheryl and Melissa and many other situations is that it doesn't, it doesn't end up sufficing for, or, or in a sense, she's got a new relationship that she's got to create, right? I mean, she, yeah. Cheryl is in a new position 
there's a new, again, play. And yeah. so, and so how do you make that transition? And so what we often will do is to say to people, have that conversation. Like you could actually, when something is awkward, it's not against the law to say, this is awkward. Right. In fact, it's actually accepting the offer. It that, is. Right? It is. It's the offer that the situation is presenting. Mm -hmm. and, and the offer that this person, this is probably hard for them also. And so um, it's a huge relief to be able to say, this is hard. I need to talk to you about some stuff that is difficult. Right. Um, frankly, I don't think that you were you know, supported in the way that you needed to be supported by your former mm -hmm. boss. Nothing I can do about that, but let's see if we can, if I can support you now. You're going through some challenges. Let's figure this out together. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, a, instead of like, well, I'm not the boss, I'm not the leader, and so I have to sort of say what is, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So that's, that is some advice, you know, just the facts doesn't do it. Bring up yeah. the elephant in the room and in a way, if they are defensive or if they are having trouble, go, go into that cave and accept that offer and say, let's figure out what to do together. Yeah. Which may yeah. mean that you don't know the answer back to the knowing paradigm problem. Yeah, you know? yeah that, is, that is so good, Kathy. You know, probably the single biggest thing I took out of that section there, and my wife and I had a conversation about it last night because we were thinking of a couple difficult conversations we need to have. And... I, I, I actually, I think this one paragraph is probably worth the price of the book easily. And that is that difficult conversations are an opportunity for building a relationship. Yeah. And um, maybe, uh, uh, maybe Sheila and Doug in their difficult conversations book said that, but I don't remember that. But I got to tell you this idea that, listen, if I go into this conversation with Melissa, that it's going to be awkward, but my goal is on the other end of it, we're even closer. Or at the other end of it with this difficult conversation with a family member, there's something about it just, it seems to bring down the defenses and reframe how we even go yes. about it, right? There's, there's built-in empathy, there's yeah. re value in the relationship. And that's, that's pretty, I think I reflected pretty close what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, totally. You nailed it. I mean, and, I, yeah. and what it makes me think of is, you know, we're not just the performers, in the scenes of our lives. We're also, we have this ability to both be in the scene and to look at how the scene is going. In some sense, we're the directors. Right. And so <clears throat> it's sort of like, you know, when you work with a director, when you're in a play, one of the things that the director does is they say to you, this is what I think this scene is about. <laughs> this is what I think you have the opportunity to do in this scene. Right. And you know, sometimes it's different than what the actor thinks. It's like, oh, well, I thought I'm supposed to be leaving my husband. You know, I'm, you know, he's been having an affair and I'm getting, you know, and, and the director says, you know, you know, actually this is a scene about where the two of you come together about, you know, what you're going to do about your daughter. You know, oh, yeah. that was, you know what I mean? But like, it gives you, so, so to your point, it's like, well, what would this scene need if, yeah. if what I wanted to do, instead of just getting through the conversation and getting it over as quickly as possible, if it was about strengthening the relationship? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's powerful. It yeah, I, I appreciate you unpacking that. You know, one last scenario, because uh, I see this a fair amount, because especially for people, I grew up in the IT information technology world, and a lot of people fancy ourselves as introverts. And as you grow... You know, like when Hermine Ibarra was on the podcast, she talked about how we need to expand our networks. And there's so many ideas that really fit between what she's talking about, yeah, you're yeah. talking. And, and, and yet, when, when some people think about networking gatherings, they're just like, oh, just shoot me, right? And so, let's say there's this guy named Douglas who goes, he knows he needs to develop these networks, but whether it's at a town hall and mingling, anything with the word mingling on it, you know, it just feels like at best, you know, it's awkward. At worst, it's a waste of time. So any thoughts on how to coach Douglas in this performance here? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a hard one. Networking is, is, is not everybody's favorite thing. Um, I learned this the hard way. This, you know, because I, even though I'm sort of, again, considered an extrovert, um, 
you know, I don't, I was never crazy about the networking stuff myself. I found it hard. Uh, and um, I once got this direction from, from a coach who said to me, why don't you be the host, even though you're not the host? Why don't you, why don't you in your character, why don't you, as a, in your performance, why don't you be, perform in a way that makes other people comfortable? That your job is to help them feel comfortable. That is some of the best performance direction I have ever gotten. And I just give it, I give it to people all the time. Because once again, one of the things about performance is that, and I think in life in general, I think it's very hard to stop doing something. Like people, you know, like stop smoking, stop eating, stop drinking, you know, whatever it is, you know. Um, I think it's easier and more helpful if you're giving people something positive to do. And then the problem or the thing you want to change sort of changes shape. It has a different, it, it's in a different gestalt. That's a great point. So if you go to the host, if you're, if you're going to a networking thing and you're like, oh my God, I have to meet people. Oh my God, I have to talk to people. Oh my God, I have to make six contacts or whatever. You know, that's like, yeah, shoot me now. Instead of like, let me see if I can speak to six people and make them more comfortable at this event. Now, you're going to have conversations with people. They're probably going to like you because you're making them more comfortable, right. being friendly. You know? Or you could decide that my performance is going to be, I'm going to be the connector. Right. I'm just going to be the connector. And you, know, I mean, and, you know, you figure out what that is. I mean, you don't want to be like over, you know, overkill and, you know, hey, over here, you buddy, over here. I was just talking, whatever. But, but it, gives, it gives you a character to be. Um, a, a performance to do and and so what and I have found this thing about hosting or being uh, making other people comfortable it's both very helpful in those kinds of situations it's also very helpful when you're talking with people who you find intimidating mm -hmm. yeah because it changes I mean it's not that I'm looking for people to have power over others but it makes you more powerful right yeah I, I agree this this idea I think you talk about being the gracious host I think is how you yeah. said it yeah, yeah. and it, it just it kind of reframes it right or the connector or the you, you the, I think the third one is the the most curious person in the world or something like that yes. yeah be very curious be a I mean curiosity you know <sighs> I, I think I mentioned Sir Ken Robinson before. Mm -hmm. he, he has this one of my favorite things that he has said, and he has said so many things that I love. But he says that our education system has actually managed to kill curiosity in children. <laughs> we are born with this. I mean, what do children do? What's that? What's that? What's that? What is that? You know, and Shut like, up. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> but our education system sort of clamps that down. And so by the time we get to be adults, it's like, we're supposed to know everything, so we're not curious. But, and we assume we, and we, we either feel like we have to know something or we assume that we do know it already. But to be curious, yeah. That, yeah. Is, that, is, that makes it much more interesting. I actually like it better than Dale Carnegie's advice. He'd say, go, you know, just ask a lot of questions. But I think the way you say it is actually a way to do what he's saying. Yeah. Just, just yeah. be curious. And, and, and you even give some guidance on how to ask the questions without judging. So anyway, a lot of really good ideas. But I, I have to, not so much the second half of the book, but the first half of the book, I, I still had this sense of, yeah, but you're asking me to be somebody who I'm not. It's the authenticity issue. And even as I talked to my wife about this, she goes, I don't know if I – I don't know if I'm going to like this idea. I won't know if you're faking it or if that's really you. And so I go, well, she goes, what would your author buddy say about that? I go, well, this is what Kathy would say. <laughs> and I would love to hear from you. But when people say, Kathy, this authenticity is so valued today, and you're actually encouraging people to not be authentic, what's your take on that? Well, I have a, here's the thing. Um, I... I'm urging that we consider a new definition or at least a, at least another way to think about what it means to be authentic. Yeah. Right. I think that when, when understandably, I think that when we think of authenticity, it's just like, I am me. I, there is one true self. Maybe there's truth, you know, there's whatever. I'm just, mm -hmm. there's, I'm who I am. And you know, that will never change, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, but I actually think that what it means to be authentic is to embrace the multiplicity of who we are. 
And the fact that, so we act and perform differently if we're giving a eulogy for a dear friend than if we're in a yoga class, than if we're, you know, in a meeting with, an, with accountants, you know, forming an LLC. That these are all, we have different performances depending on the scenes that we're in. And one is not more authentic than the other. It's the, it's the way you perform given the scene you're in. We don't think of them as different versions of ourselves, but they are. And Walt Whitman says, um, he says, you know, do I contain contradictions? I am large, you know, I, I, I have multitudes. And I really like that idea. So if we're, if we are, if in fact who we are is, you know, um, that we contain multitudes, then what does it mean for there to be one true self? I think that what it means to be authentic is to give expression to our multiplicity. And I think that if we are in the growing space, if we are, if what we, if the way we want to live is, I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to make connections and to dis, to discover what life is. Hmm. Then that means I have to be in that space, which includes me being who I am and who I'm not at the same time. I mean, when a little kid learns to ride a bicycle, you know, they don't, they're pretending to ride a bicycle in order to ride a bicycle. There's nothing inauthentic about that. They, right. they have to get on it and fall and get on it and fall and get on it and fall as part of the process of figuring out how you ride a bicycle. And so I think that we get stuck in our identities and it does feel weird when you start doing something that is unnatural and that, that doesn't feel like you. Right. And I feel like what's wrong with feeling weird. Right. Right. That's, that's a great point. Like I, I suppose any sort of approach or way we reframe things in our mind can be used for good or for evil, I suppose. So the way, the way I tried to explain to my wife was, I'm being authentic to who I want to be. <laughs> I'm just not there yet. Like I want to be calmer in these sort of situations or I want to be more present when I'm tempted to, you know, pick up my phone and things like that. So it's authentic there. And I guess, you know, what actually turned the conversation last night about this was uh, Herminia Ibarra's comment that you include that authenticity is often an excuse for unwillingness to change. Yeah, yeah. And that I'm like, well, you know, I can't do what you're asking here because that's not me. And it's just really a way of saying. Back to the becoming principle, Andy. We are not, I'm not trying to help people to be who they are not. Right. I'm trying to help. And we at Performance of a Lifetime are helping people be both who they are and who they're not at the same time. Yeah. That's the multiplicity thing, right? right? Right, right. So it's not a denial of who you are. And I, so if that's what your wife is concerned about, I get it. Yeah. No, I really get it. And I think that's important. But we so often just stay there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so good. You know, I, uh, I just find you so fascinating, Kathy, because you've been, you know, uh, your career just so far, you've been an author. That was a new role for you, right? To play the performance, right? right? Jazz singer, composer, director, still member of uh, an improv crew, you know, you've helped countless thousands of people change. And you would think that by now, there's no role that makes you nervous or feels like you have to go into the cave in improv speak. So what, what's an example that still maybe you'd say freaks you out or still makes you feel like you're part of the becoming, if that makes sense? Well, first of all, you know, um, you did send me that question in advance. So <laughs> the whole morning, the whole morning, I was like obsessing over this question. <laughs> I, love it. I love it so much. Um, no, it's such a good question. Um, I, have two, I have two answers. I think that the, the author performance is a new performance for me. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say that I'm freaked out. But I would say that I'm, it, you know, it's new, you know, it's new for me and I, uh, I'm really enjoying it a lot, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I haven't been on television yet. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the first start towards that. <laughs> first start towards that. So I know that before 
I, what, you know, the first time I go on television, I, I will be freaked out. Mm -hmm. um, that's one answer. The other answer is that when you get to be my age, freaking out is too exhausting. <laughs> 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 Love it. Right. So you actually just, you know what? I'm just not going to get freaked out about it. I am going to survive this. <laughs> you know, I, I buy that 100%. This is one of my favorite things of getting older is things I got, you know, but, but maybe that's because earlier we were in the becoming and now you just, you know, this is maybe the good side of knowing, uh, you know, that you'll be on the other side, but. Well, that's, but it's actually, I still think it's in the becoming principle because I feel like this is what it feels like. And like it, it, I will survive it. And, and, um, you know, and I, I think that it has helped me to be more curious and, and interested in the fear, you know, even while I have the fear. Right. Right. Yeah. That's good. You know, uh, for those listening, this just gives you a taste of what you're going to get from Kathy Salit's new book, Performance Breakthrough. Um, I highly recommend the book. I invite you to check out the show notes. There's a link to Kathy's website so you can learn more about her organization, Performance of a Lifetime, as well as information about the book. So, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us for the People and Projects podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. It's wonderful to chat with you. Special thanks to Kathy Salit for joining us for this episode. You know, there are a number of things I really liked about this book. I mentioned at the outset of the program how this has been very influential on me. You know, probably the single biggest thing I took away from this book as far as a practical idea is that when you have a difficult conversation coming up, and, and think about it, I mean, we could have lots of those. It could be like in the interview, I asked her about the performance of somebody on your team. It could be a difficult conversation you need to have with a boss, with a vendor. It could be way outside of work with a loved one. You know what? These are things we don't look forward to, right? And what she talks about is go into this conversation with the mindset that when we're on the other side of this conversation, that our relationship is stronger. And now this has alignment with what Dan Shapiro talked with us about in the last episode from negoti negotiating the non-negotiable, right? where we have these different tribes. And sometimes what we do is when we're having these difficult conversations, all of a sudden it's my tribe versus your tribe and there's all kinds of vertigo, right? He talked about all that other stuff. Well, what I like about how what Kathy adds to that discussion is as I'm planning that discussion, just imagine if you went into this saying, all right, it's not gonna be fun, and uh, there could be some conflict out of this, like Michael Roberto talks about with cognitive conflict, that's fine, that could be okay. But I'm just not gonna let it get affective, which is to say, go over the line of respect. Because when I get on the other side of that, I want our relationship to be even deeper or stronger, okay? So, I mean, it's been, a, I don't know, a month since I've read the book and a couple weeks since I interviewed Kathy and I've been practicing this. I'm telling you, it's a powerful idea. So I wanna encourage you to try it. So I'm interested in your take. What, what did you find interesting in this interview? Send me an email at show at peopleandprojectspodcast.com. I'd love to hear what you thought of the interview. And also, what do you like about the People and Projects podcast? I'd, I'd love to get your feedback on that. So thank you for joining me for this episode of the People and Projects podcast. Stay tuned for some outtakes from the episode. Have yourself a great week. Hey, Kathy. Hi, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Well, I, I could I could just say, you know, uh, that's not just everybody that'll sign up for a video interview, you know. That was Well, I had to spend the entire morning I went to the hairdresser. I got, you know, I had a lot of makeup. I had to do I had to work out. I mean, you know, thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, well, you know, okay, so so I know uh, you talk about Amy Cuddy in your book, right? Yeah. So 
So one minute before I'm interviewing her, I text her. I said, hey, if you have any trouble, you know, getting on the video, let me know. And she texts back, it's a video? Because <laughs> her, her, her equivalent of Lauren, was, uh, somehow the message didn't get across. And so she goes, I need 20 minutes to get a face on. So, uh. so funny. Well, you know, because otherwise I would have been in my pajamas. You know? right. I mean, I'm glad that you gave me a little bit of notice. So. I would have I been on my biking clothes. So it all, I guess this is just ruining our days here. But I, I have to tell you, Kathy, I, uh, it's such a powerful book. And I think Michelle had sent it out. And uh, I saw the title and I thought, all right, uh, it looks interesting. I see, oh, Dan Pink's got his name on it. I look inside and I think, well, maybe, maybe I ought to read this. And, you know, I can't tell you, you know, it, it, maybe it's like when people are in your workshops and they're just kind of like wired. There were so many times I'm like, oh, 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 that's such a good idea. Like that Twyla Tharp quote. Do you remember this? This is Twyla Tharp quote. You yeah, this? yeah, yeah, yeah. If we only keep doing the same thing, we're going to get that we're really, really good at. We never get a chance to, to fail and do anything new. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually... I think it's it's deprivational. Like I think that it's it's a it, it does it makes life, mm. you, know, you know, it's too predictable, and so you want you want that kind of stuff. And so, just to show this skeptic in me, after I read the first part about your uh, your story, I think, well, of course, this is easy for her. She's a singer. She's a proper person. But the more I read it, the more I like, no, 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 this really. Does, in fact, you know what you blew away for me was this whole idea that you're either an introvert or an extrovert, right? It, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny because I have a very good friend. I mean, it, it's the very thing you're talking about because I have a very good friend who, actually, he's my boyfriend. I mean, he met my father for the first time this uh, weekend. So it was sort of like a big to-do, right? So, and he is, he is like what, you know, he calls himself an introvert. He's like sort of the classic introvert. And so, you know, he said to me, now that, it, you know, we know each other he knows what i do he says you know do you have any performance direction for me <laughs> and i said yeah i said be your warm self i said be curious you know and know that my father is a total character and just you know but but be your warm self so then you know and it was you know it was fabulous it went wonderfully you know at the end of it you know when we came home afterwards it was like three hours he sits down and he's like i'm exhausted <laughs> being an introvert <laughs> he goes oh my god how do you do that all the time <laughs> yeah yeah, but 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 if I remember right, you say in the book that uh, your dad is it Murray? Do I remember seeing yes, that, yes. He's, that he's an ad man, right? Ad man. <laughs> so so he probably just kept it rolling, did he? Totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I I was really intrigued by the role that your parents had because when your mom was like, "Well, let's just start our own school," you know, kudos to uh, to mom. Yeah. There, man. Yeah, no, she was an amazing lady. And yeah. There isn't, there literally isn't a day that goes, I mean, I'm sure this is the case for many of us who, you know, and our parents when we've lost them, but yeah. she's like, she was a revolutionary. And, yeah. and so she just sort of like said, you know, no, don't, you know, don't, don't accept the status quo. So yeah, that was awesome. Okay. God, way to go. That was, you know, a lot of fun. I wish I could be out in New York and have this conversation. Uh, directly. Yeah, really? <laughs> it's been a really good sport. I kept you so much longer than I intended to, but I oh, really, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just sorry if I messed up your schedule. No, but thank not you. At all. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, not at all. This would be perfect. And the, uh, I've gotten feedback that people really like the video because it's more intimate, right? It's, it's, it's more intimate and people get a better sense of who that person is. And so. I went, I went on your website and I, I mean, I didn't, I, I listened to a number of podcasts, which mm -hmm. I mean, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to talk to this guy. He was you're such a, really such a good interviewer, but I didn't see other video stuff. Yeah. There's uh maybe two or three of them up there, but okay. it's, it's it, honestly, it's hard to get people to agree to do it. Really? Yeah. It's, I think, I mean, it feels riskier, right? And so it's the, uh, but I figured. Well, that's my I, hair. That's what I want to know. You look awesome. You look awesome. <laughs> but, but I will say that uh, I, if there was anybody that was going to say yes, I was fully expecting it would be you. So thank you very much, Kathy. My pleasure. Hey, enjoy your weekend. Yeah, and you thank too. you Have so much. Weekend. Enjoy the good weather in Chicago. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. See ya. Bye-bye. <laughs>